Good morning, grade nines. Today we're going to continue with visual literacy. We're going to look at terminology first and then mark the worksheets from the last three lessons. Terminology that you should know. The first one are puns. The pun is a form of a word or word play that exploits multiple meanings of a term or of similar sounding words for an intended humorous or rhetorical effect. Have a look at this ad here. Buy our pizza. We need the dough. So here's a great example of wordplay. They've used the word need, as in to need a dough, to prepare the dough with your, your fists on the counter. However, if you had to spell it N-E-E-D, as in a want, you need it. The word dough is also cleverly used. Another word for money, a slang word, is dough, as in we need money. So by our pizza, we need the money. We need the dough. So it's quite a clever play on the idea of need and dough. The next one is satire. And satire is the use of humor, irony, or exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues. We looked at this while we did the cartoon lesson. Let's have a look at this cartoon. Crumbs for the people. Here we see a large man sitting at a table, eating what looks like a good meal. We can also note that there are crumbs falling down the table to a large group of people who are a lot smaller with plates raised to try and catch the crumbs. The satire is used to expose how stupid humankind is in terms of the people who have so much excess versus the people who have so little, almost nothing, that they have to beg for food. So one man's crumbs is a feast for a large group of people. He has a cartoon by a South African cartoonist, the Zapiro. You can see immediately that it's a commuter that is waiting for the train. Behind him, a sign that says train schedule that reinforces this idea. However, if you've been following the news, you would know that over the past few years, the metro rail network has almost collapsed. We know the trains are often late, and this is due to vandalism. Have a look at the train schedule behind the man. Trashed, gutted, burnt out, still burning. So it highlights how vandalism has almost brought this railway network to its knees and the people who suffer are the commuters, which are usually the poor. The next one is sarcasm. And this is the use of irony to mock or convey contempt. Contempt means the feeling that a person or a thing is worthless. So something that is beneath consideration. It's a total disregard for something that should actually be considered. Have a look at this cartoon. And below, it's titled, Sarcasm and Stupidity Meet at the Elevator. The lady says, congratulations, you broke the code. If you press the elevator button three times after it's already been pressed, it goes into hurry mode. And the man replies, really? He actually clearly uses sarcasm at a frustration at the man who continuously pushes the button. I'm sure we've all been waited at a lift once before and felt very impatient. Or you've seen somebody continuously press that button in the hope that the elevator or the lift will hurry up. We know that this isn't the case. So yeah, she's in a, t in a way mocking or insulting the man because of his consistent pressing of the button. If you're a fan of the series Friends, you would know that Chandler, one of the characters in the series, is a king at sarcasm. Have a look on YouTube for some of his best moments. Irony. This is the expression of one's meaning by using language that normally signifies the opposite. So usually when one thing happens that we expect to happen, the opposite happens. It's often done for humor or emphatic effect. Have a look at the, these two adverts placed below each other. One says childhood obesity, don't take it lightly. We know that it's a doctor because she's wearing a stethoscope. Below, an advert from McDonald's, my kind of shopping spree. Now we know that McDonald's has been linked to obesity. We know that this takeaway food isn't exactly the healthiest. It's ironic that it's placed right below an advert 
that warns of childhood obesity and us obviously in a way trying to fight obesity where McDonald's is promoting the purchase of their product. We do need to look at three types of irony. The first one is verbal. And this is used when a person wants to express something using speech, which says the opposite of what they mean. For example, if, I were, if it were a very cold day, a person using verbal irony might say something like, isn't it a warm day? Obviously the opposite. Situational irony, this is used when a situation does not have the outcome which was expected in the first instance. If a fire station were to burn down, this would be situational irony, as this is the building which is meant to stop fires. And the third one is dramatic irony. In a real life situation, it is applied when something happens and the person within the situation is unaware of the true reality. If a person were to say, I am so glad that I wasn't in the car today, only to be involved in a car accident moments later, this would be dramatic irony. Let's watch this video explaining irony in the three types by the Khan Academy. Hello, grammarians. Uh, today I want to talk about the concept of irony, which is a very difficult concept to nail down because it means so many things. But Let's begin with the best definition I can muster, which is that irony is the difference between expectation and result. Now this, this contains a lot within it, right? So that means that irony is not only the engine of surprise, but also jokes. All jokes in English function uh, on this engine of the difference between expectation and result. You expect to hear one thing, uh, and then a joke plays with your expectation. Now, there's nothing less funny than explaining why things are funny, but this is uh, why things are funny. Uh, so today we're going to talk about three different kinds of irony, and I'm going to give you an example of each. Now, the first kind is called situational irony. In situational irony, everyone is aware of the discrepancy of the difference between expectation and result. And a really classic example of this is the O. Henry short story, The Gift of the Magi. And it's about a couple who are very poor, but who love each other very much. And each one wants to get the other a really nice Christmas present. Now, the man has a very lovely watch, and the woman has really lovely long hair. And unbeknownst to the other, um, the woman buys her husband a watch chain, and the man buys his wife a comb. But in order to do that, he sells his watch to buy her the comb. And in order to buy him the watch chain, the woman sells her hair. And so they give each other gifts that are now useless. This watch chain and this comb for the hair that isn't there and the watch that isn't there. And the irony is that they are now aware that the, the lengths that they went to for the other kind of ruined each other's gifts. That's situational irony. It's, it's kind of a happy ending because it proves uh, stuff is just stuff and they love each other very much. That's situational irony. Everyone is aware of the discrepancy. Irony variant number two is called dramatic irony. Uh, and this means that there's an unevenly distributed awareness of the difference, specifically that there's an audience. So this is the sort of thing that really only comes into play in fiction or in dramatic work. So we're talking about a play or a movie or whatever. So let's say we've got a play, here's our stage, here's our, here's our audience down here. We have one character here, character A, uh, who, who really doesn't like bears. And is talking about if he ever meets a bear, he's probably going to punch that bear right in the face. And here is character B, who is a bear, but is a bear in disguise, wearing a hat and a tie. Now, uh, character B knows that character B is a bear. The audience knows that character B is a bear. Character A is unaware. So we have this unevenly distributed awareness of the difference between expectation and result. Character A expects that character B is not a bear, but character B and the audience knows that the opposite is true. That's dramatic irony. Now the third kind of irony we're going to talk about today is called verbal irony. So the irony of words. 
And this one's a little different because verbal irony is the difference between a stated meaning and an actual meaning. And this means that it can come in a couple of flavors. The most notable and perhaps the most confusing is called sarcasm. And sarcasm is when you say a thing, but it actually ends up meaning something quite different, usually the opposite. So let's say an anvil, very heavy metal object, falls on my foot, breaks my foot. I'm in extraordinary pain. If you asked me how I was doing and I wanted to use sarcasm, I would say something like, oh, I'm just great. And I'm signaling with, um, with my tone and also context to indicate that the opposite is true to say, I'm actually terrible, my foot is broken. That's sarcasm. Now, related to sarcasm is the pun, which is usually a joke that uh, plays on multiple meanings. So again, let's take this case, let's say my foot was crushed by an anvil, you asked me how I'm doing, I would say, oh, I'm feeling a little flat today. No, not a great joke, sure, but what I'm trying to express is that I am both um, playing on the notion that I don't feel well, I feel a little flat, and that my foot has been squished by a heavy object, literally rendering it flat. That's what a pun is. And again, I recognize that by explaining the joke, I have made the joke unfunny. I apologize. So to review, let's put all of these together into one giant ironic situation. So let's say, you're watching a sitcom on television, and this sitcom takes place in someone's apartment, and that apartment has a thing called a Murphy bed. Now, what a Murphy bed is, is a bed that folds up into the wall to save space in a small apartment. It's got this little handle up here, you grab it, you pull it down, it becomes just a regular bed. Otherwise, it's kept folded up into the wall. So let's say we're watching a sitcom that takes place in a small apartment that has a Murphy bed. Let's say that our main character has just come home from the airport with her visiting cousin. So again, this is a sitcom, this is all happening on your television, right? So this is all inside the frame. Now, unbeknownst to our protagonist, let's call her Anna, and her cousin, let's call her Bella, a lion has crawled into the Murphy bed while the two of them were out. I promise this has a point. All right, so, so hidden behind this wall is a lion on top of this bed. Now, ignorant of all of this, Bella asks her cousin, is the Murphy bed comfortable? To which Anna replies, yeah, it's perfect for a lion on. I think you see where I'm going here. So, dramatic irony. We, the audience, on the other side of the screen, are aware that this entire time there is a lion hiding in the Murphy bed. We know this, Anna and Bella do not. Bella asks if the bed is comfortable, Anna assures her that it is. We know, as the audience, it is not. There is a dangerous savanna predator in the bed. That's dramatic irony. Situational irony, when they pull that Murphy bed down and expose the lion, they will see the difference between these expectations and this result. And that is situational irony. You thought one thing was true, and now something very different has happened. That's the difference between expectation and result. Bed don't usually have lions in them. You expect them not to have lions in them. You pull down the bed, boom, there's a lion in it. Situational irony. Finally, it's perfect for lion on. Now, Anna does not realize this, but she is unwittingly punning on the fact that there is a lion on the Murphy bed. So this is verbal irony, because in fact, there is a lion, lion, on the bed. So there you have it, encapsulated in one ridiculous case. Here are all three basic examples of irony. So situational irony, dramatic irony, and verbal irony. You can learn anything, David out. Okay, so feel free to rewatch that video. Um, it explains the three types of irony quite well. It will be a good idea to now work on these skills so that you're able to identify what type of irony is used in a cartoon or an advert. Now let's mark the three worksheets that you've been completing over the previous lessons. The first one on cartoons, here the question asked, 
Refer to frame one. Identify what Calvin's facial expression and body language tells us about the mood that he's in. Right, so Calvin's mouth and eyes are wide open and his arms are outstretched in front of him, showing that he is excited, he's happy about the snowman that he has built. Okay, so we see how the cartoonist has drawn this character, Calvin being the boy, Hobbes being the tiger. Okay, his mouth is open, his arms are out. It shows that he's quite excited. Question 1.2 asked, refer to frame one, explain why we know that Hobbes, remember Hobbes is the tiger, is curious by making reference to his body language and facial expression. So have a look at how the cartoonist has drawn Hobbes in this frame. Yeah, he has his hand covering his mouth and his eyebrows are raised. So this shows that he's thinking. Perhaps he's not entirely convinced or he doesn't share the same energy that Calvin does about the snowman that he has built. 1.3, this question asked you to refer to frame two. How do we know that Calvin is impressed with himself? We know that he is impressed with himself because his mouth and eyes are wide open and his face is raised and arm outstretched to make as if he's presenting something. Have a look at how the cartoonist has positioned Calvin. We almost see it from the top where his face is looking up and this shows his emotion quite well. 1.4, refer to frame three. Explain what the word sordid means and why it's applicable to the storyline of this cartoon. Sordid means doing something dishonorable and immoral. It's applicable to the storyline because in frame one, Calvin has made a snowman that is eating an ice cream cone. But what he has used to fill the ice cream cone is the snow from another snowman. This makes it sordid because the snowman is depicted as dead with holes in its back and the snowman in frame one would be eating the other snowman. This would then make it seem immoral. Calvin uses the word sordid. This is, or it's a sordid story. The next one you had to look at a Madame and Eve cartoon between Mother Anderson and the devil. Frame, refer to frame one. Who is the character on the left? Support your answer with reference to the image. So the character on the left is the devil. Okay, and we, sorry, not he, we know this by the horns on his head and his tail. So we can immediately identify how the cartoonist has drawn this character so we know that it's the devil. Once again, look carefully at what the cartoonist has done. Look at how he's drawn the characters. This tells us the story. 2.2, what South African is the issue that Mother Anderson is referring to? So if you have a look at frame four, she says there, you work for ESCOM, my head hurts. Okay, because in the previous frame, in frame three, the devil says they call me the Prince of Darkness. So this cartoon is taking a dig at ESCOM and load shedding. Frame two, or question 2.3, refer to frame four. Identify the emotion the character on the right is experiencing. Support your answer by making reference to the sketch. Okay, so once again, have a look at how the cartoonist has drawn the devil. His hand is on his face. So the emotion he's probably experiencing is that he's feeling extremely annoyed, in disbelief, frustrated. His hand is over his head, covering his eyes. His mouth is drawn upside down and his shoulders are slumped, not achieving the reaction he wants. Clearly he's frustrated that he hasn't gotten through to Mother Anderson. Right, the next lesson we did advertising, you had to complete the worksheet. The first question you yeah, asked, identify the genre of this movie. Here you are given an image of an advertisement advertising a new release of a movie. So the genre is either crime or suspense or thriller. The next question then asked you to provide visual evidence for your answer to question 1.1. So how do we know the type of genre? Have a look at the picture. Here, there's a police lineup. 
Okay, we see five men standing next to each other with lines behind them. Suspicious looks of people in the lineup. And obviously you weren't given a, 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 a colored copy, but the use of red and black would also tell us if you were to receive a colored copy. Then 1.3 suggests a possible reason why the color red should be used for the movie poster. Red symbolizes anger or violence. In this case, it is a crime suspense movie. Therefore, the red will symbolize blood. So blood being spilt because of crime. 2.1. Here you're given an advert for Coca-Cola titled, A Classic Never Goes Out of Style. 2.1. Who would the target market for this product be? Validate your answer. So the target market, all people who love Coca-Cola. The reason? Classics are enjoyed by people of all ages, as the slogan implies. Or this could also be people who idolize icons from the 60s. The images of Marilyn Monroe, Elvis, and the Beatles are used on the bottle. So therefore, the product can be associated with anybody. Anybody enjoys these classic icons, might relate themselves or see themselves drinking a Coca-Cola. It's always important to understand is if you ask the question, what is the purpose of the advertisement or whose benefit does the advertisement serve? It's always the product being advertised, Coca-Cola. Remember, they want us to spend our money on the product so they can be successful. So whose interests are served in this advert? It's not the people or the people who drink Coke. It's Coca-Cola themselves because they stand to benefit from us supporting their product. 2.2, read the slogan. What does it imply regarding people's tastes? Slogan, a classic never goes out of style. So the answer there is Coca-Cola will always be in style. It will always be relevant. People will always enjoy a classic and keep going back to it. 2.3, discuss how the font of the advertisement reinforces the message. The classic curly or known as ribbon font reinforces the message of Coke being a classic. As consumers, as soon as we see that font, we are immediately identified with Coke. The font and Coke have been around for a long time and will continue to be around. 2.4, explain how the slogan and the picture in the advertisement have been linked. Okay, so the bottle displays the faces of people who are timeless and still idolized by many people, including teenagers. The word classic in the slogan ties in with this as they are classics, just like Coca-Cola. And then 3.1, you were given an advert by Nando's, one of the more funnier adverts that we all enjoy as South Africans. Discuss how the copy of the advertisement, which is the writing, reinforces the graphic, the picture. This was question 3.1. Here, the copy gives the literal meaning of Mandela's middle name pulling branch. The sketch shows a boy pulling on the branch of a tree. So it's a clever link between the wording, okay, Nelson Mandela's middle name, meaning pulling branch, and the little child pulling a branch from the tree. 3.2. How does Nando's ruffle feathers? Nando's regularly launch advertising campaigns that cause sensation and upset people. They're often seen as controversial, because they touch on truly South African issues and often make it humorous. Once again, go onto YouTube and have a look at some of the funny adverts. 3.3, explain how both Nelson Mandela and Nando's can be viewed as fire starters. Remember in the title it says there, from one fire starter to another, happy 94th birthday, Madiba. So how are they both fire starters? Mandela fought against the government. Okay, he made a change called social change. And Nando's pushes the advertising boundaries with what they release as campaigns. The third worksheet you had to do was with a propaganda lesson that we did yesterday. You had to watch three clips and link it to either bandwagon, testimonial, or name calling. The Coca-Cola advert, which was the first one you had to watch, this was an example of bandwagon. 
they actually chose a bottle of Coke, bringing together all kinds of different people on a subway train. So everybody's doing it. The direct TV ad is an example of name calling. That tells us that watching cable television, which is your classic TV, rather than direct TV, will have horrible consequences. There'd be a cost to it. And then the Gatorade advert is an example of testimonial. In its very short running time, the ad shows us many different celebrities who are all excelling in their sport. We then make the assumption that the only reason why they are excelling is because they are drinking Gatorade. So again, I hope these three lessons have equipped you full visual literacy. It's one of the more fun or more enjoyable parts of English, um, but it's something that is so relevant and something that is so real that we face with every day. And it's something that forces us to question, to ask questions, and to search for answers.